Atheists must think that God is important because they seem to talk about Him so much of the time. They're right, of course. God either matters a great deal or He doesn't matter at all. Science now shows God's existence is highly probable. If He really does exist, then an intelligent understanding of the original prime mover is immensely important. Who is God? Is He a person or just a blind, impersonal force? Was Jesus God? Find out today on The Carter Report. Welcome back. We're talking about God. What is God like? The Bible says that God is love. We talked about this in the last part of the program. But if God is love, why is there evil in the world? Why is there suffering? This is one of the greatest of all problems, one of the greatest of all questions. But there is an answer. Because God is love, he is given to every one of us and to the spirit beings that are called angels, he's given to them the capacity of making choices. Now, if they couldn't make choices, if they didn't have freedom, then they couldn't love. You can't love. You can't love somebody. That's, it's impossible to love somebody if you don't have the capacity and the ability to love them. <laughs> that's, that's all there is to it. Now, if you see a young couple and, and they're very much in love, you know they're in love because they've chosen to be in love. You imagine if, if they were ro- robots, they couldn't love each other if they were robots. So God gave to us this very risky gift of the capacity of choosing. He gave it to, to Satan. We're going to talk about Satan next week. Now, Satan was a being who was completely sinless. He was always happy. And, but God said, because I love you, you're going to be free. God is the God of freedom. God is not a dictator. And so in some way that we don't really comprehend, Satan became puffed up with himself and he chose to go against God. It was a choice. But that choice had to be there for Satan to have the capacity to love God and to love other people. That's why there's evil in the world, because of the perversion of the gift of freedom. Uh, I spoke about this when I gave that... uh, told you that tremendous story from the Russian Dostoevsky. You remember this. The old inquisitor. He said, we've taken away from these people freedom and now they're happy at last because they don't have to choose. We make all the choices for them. God gave to our first parents, my friends, the gift of choice. And because they made the wrong choice, Suffering and sin and death like a tremendous tsunami poured into the world. Suffering exists because of freedom and freedom exists because of love. But the day is coming when people are going to realise that even though they're going to keep their freedom and have, they're going to keep the capacity of choice, they're not going to want to do bad things because they'll realise that the happiest people are the people who follow God and who keep his commandments. So God is love, but God is also infinitely powerful. In Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9, you read these really scientific words, Psalm 33, 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He breathed it into existence. And all the host of them by the the breath of his mouth. He breathed it and there was a universe, trillions of universes, of galaxies. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. These are absolutely astounding words. Einstein taught us to believe this. Matter can be turned into energy. And that's what happens when you have a hydrogen bomb. So you take a little bit of, of matter and you can turn it into energy. But Einstein told us the equation can be reversed and therefore energy can be turned into matter. And God had so much 
energy and so much power, infinite power, that he, he spoke. He breathed it. And there was a universe. So he is infinitely powerful. There's no limit to his power. He's infinitely righteous and uh, just. He doesn't need an FBI investigation. (laughs) He hasn't been doing any crooked little deals. He hasn't been conspiring with the enemy. He's completely righteous, and that is why there's going to be a judgment. He's infinitely wise. Now, wisdom is more than knowledge. God has got a huge amount of knowledge, but he makes no mistakes because he's infinitely wise. And if you want to get some of his wisdom, read the book of Proverbs. Read it through. Read it slowly, the wisdom of God. He's infinitely all-knowing. That means God knows everything about everything, all the time. He knows what you're thinking now. How does that make you feel? God knows what you're thinking now. God knows what you were thinking last night. He knows what you're thinking tomorrow. All-knowing. He knows all about us. He's infinitely redemptive. That means he's got a heart that is so big and so full of love that he's infinitely redemptive. Now here's a great text in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I want to read it to you, and I want you to read it also. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he was God, he was in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Listen to me. Some of the viewers may find this so hard to believe they're not going to believe it, but others are going to believe it. They're going to make the right choice. The Bible says that the Almighty God, (laughs) the Almighty God who made the universe became a baby and became a man and died for our sins on the cross. There's nothing as important as that. Nothing as important. I see people all the time getting at their cell phones because they're addicted, you see. It's an addiction. We know this. Psychologists tell us that it's hurting their brains. But the more their brains are hurt, the more they're... You know why? The people who make those things know how to turn them on. It's a science. And millions of people are being brainwashed all the time. They, they can't even come into, a meet, into church with a... Um, there's this need deep inside them to be loved. There's this need for some warmth in their lives. Their lives are generally so shallow and so empty that they've got to have something. But the Bible teaches that God is so loving that he became a human being. John chapter 8, verses 56 to 58. This is one of the great texts. John chapter 8, 56 to 58. Jesus said to the Jews, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Look at these words. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, not I was, but I am. The Bible says the Jews, being logical and understanding the the consequence of his teaching, they took up stones to murder him because they said, this man is claiming to be God. Jesus said, before Abraham was born, didn't say I was, he said, I am. Always there, I am. This person, am. When I discovered this truth as a boy, it stunned me 
It thrilled me and overwhelmed me. It immersed me in its great grandeur and greatness. This almighty God, whose name, we're hesitant to say this word, the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. It is translated in the Bible by the words Lord in caps, Lord. Uh, rather poor translation is Yahweh, but it's not bad. But the real translation is Y-H-W-H, Jesus said, before Abraham was born. I am. I want you to think about this, then everything gets in its true perspective. I want to describe, if I can, his birth. He was born in a shed at the back of Motel 6 because there was no room for him in the inn. Who's this person? It's God. You know why we find it hard? I say it to you, I say it to you, love, and charity, and kindness. The reason we find it hard to understand truth is because we have been brainwashed by the foolishness and the superficiality of this age. This is why we've got to be on these things all the time to fill the hole in our hearts. It is a symptom of our sickness and a symptom of our despair. It's a symptom of our loneliness. And that is why some people always have to have their phone ringing so they're saying to people, I'm important. Somebody's calling me. I'm important. You may not know, but I'm important. My phone is ringing all the time. It's the symptom of our despair. When he was born, there were no marching bands, no choirs, no delegations from the Sanhedrin or the church up the road. Apparently, God is not pompous or ostentatious. You get that? He's not pompous or ostentatious. Why did he come? He came to show us what God is like. He was totally unlike the religious people of his day. He didn't become, when he was born, a church leader, a pope, a president, a king, a businessman, but a baby born of a peasant girl and his job when he grew up was a carpenter. <laughs> what is God like? Not like most of us. Not like any of us. Totally unpretentious. Not pompous and not churchy. God thinks differently. When he's around 30 years of age, he becomes a preacher and a healer. The two most important professions in life, a preacher and a healer. Two most important jobs. Never, not a politician, no. Never put down preaching. Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, Paul, John Wesley, all great preachers. Why? It's the most important thing to communicate the grace of God to the world. Nothing else is as important. And healing is a close second. Why did they show Billy Graham so much honor at his death? Why was his body taken to Washington, D.C.? Why did the president come? Why did they make the speeches? Because he'd done more good for America than all those politicians put together. That's the reason. That's the reason. Even those carnal men saw greatness. Jesus was a preacher. And he told stories, many sto stories to show what God is like. In Luke chapter 15, it's one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, Luke 15, 1 and 2. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, religious people always moaning, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And Jesus said, guilty. Yes, I do. Because the goodness of God is, is that he likes sinners. How can he like sinners who are so defiled and he is so righteous? That is his love. This is the miracle of the gospel. This man goes and he eats with sinners. And Jesus said, you're dead right. 
Absolutely. Then he told the story of the lost, selfish, naughty little boy. Luke 15, 11 and 12. Look at it. Luke 15, 11 and 12. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me, give me, give me, give me. Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Don't have sympathy for this boy. He's an ungrateful young larrikin. He takes his father's money before the old man's dead. The Bible says he goes into a far country. That's where every, every sinner goes. You may be there in the far country. Why are people continually drinking alcohol, taking drugs? You know why? Because of the emptiness inside. They're in the far country. But they're so blind uh, that they don't know it. The Bible says he wastes everything. He's a Jewish boy. He wastes everything. Spends his money on prostitutes and he ends up a Jewish boy feeding the pigs. And he gets so hungry, he eats the pig food. Let me tell you, if you're away from God and if you're in the far country, you're living on pig's food. Oh, I've got to go to this movie. I've got to do this. I've got to see this. I can't wait for another second. You're living on pig's food. Why don't we wake up and realize that the devil is dancing on us? The Bible says after he's lived on pig food for long enough, he comes to himself and he makes his way home thinking the old man's going to smack him around the head. <sighs> Look at Luke 15, verse 20 and 21. Luke 15, 20 and 21. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, think of this, his father saw him had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He doesn't kick him, he kisses him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight am no longer worthy to be called your son. You know what the father says? Don't say anything more. <laughs> what is God like? Verse 22 and 23. The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Goodness me. Puts a ring on his hand. Oh, sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf. It gets worse. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. You know who this old man is? This is God. The old man is God. Not at all like the Pharisees. Not at all like these stiff and stuffy and obnoxious religionists. The Father's got a heart as big as the universe. You know why? Because he made it. It has been said, there are two great truths that we are slow to learn. Oh, here it is. Man is far worse than he ever feared to think. That's us. We're worse than we've ever, ever feared to think. But God is far better than he ever dared to hope. God is far better than he ever dared to hope. You know this painting? It hangs in the Hermitage. When Beverly and I have gone there to St. Petersburg on many occasions, we've stood there and we've looked at the wonderful painting of the prodigal son. The prodigal son was blessed because he had a prodigal father. Did you know that? You know what prodigal means? Extravagant, abundant, over and beyond. This boy is over and beyond in his sin, but the old father is over and beyond in his love and his grace. Mm. That's what God's like. Jesus was the special friend and defender of sexually exploited women. Anybody who is down on women is an enemy of God, I tell you. 
John chapter 8, verses 3, 4, and 5. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman, not a man. <laughs> didn't bring a man. You know why they didn't bring a man? They would have had to bring themselves. Scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman ugh, caught in adultery. And when they'd set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? You know the story, don't you? He got down, he wrote in the sand the dirty secrets of their dirty lives. Then he said to the woman, Has anybody condemned you because those cowards just ran away? He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is what God is like, the friend of sinners the friend of sexually exploited women. And finally, the God-man took all the sin of the world upon himself. It's almost too hard to believe that the God-man, the creator of the cosmos, would take all the sin of the world upon himself. Why? Almost too hard to believe. John 3, 14 to 17 one of the strangest texts. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him uh, might be saved. Where does the serpent fit into this? Ever thought about that? Doesn't say, as Moses lifted up the lamb in the wilderness, he lifted up the serpent. And the serpent became the symbol of Christ. Why? Because the serpent is the symbol of sin. And on the cross, Christ took our sin upon himself. What is God like? It's better than we can understand or comprehend. On the Roman cross, don't forget it. He felt all the pain, the despair, the sorrow, the agony, the depression of a lost world. And he went to the cross because he loves you. And some say, oh, I couldn't do that for God. It's too much. God would say, get a life and realize that hanging on the cross was the creator of the universe. There's an old skeptic who was dying. A young man went across to see him as a Christian and took his Bible. The old skeptic said, get out of here and never come back again. He came home and he told his wife that the old skeptic had said, I don't want your old Bible. Now the little girl was only five or six and she just received her first Bible. So she thought, well, if he doesn't want daddy's old Bible, maybe he'll have my new Bible. So she went to see him and she took his, her new Bible and he read it. And as he read it, he found the story of Christ. After his death, they found this poem that the old skeptic had written. Listen to it. I've tried in vain a thousand ways my fears to quell my hopes to raise. But what I need, the Bible says, is ever only Jesus. My soul is night, my heart is steel. I cannot see, I cannot feel. For light, for life, I must appeal in simple faith to Jesus. He died, he lives, he reigns, he pleads. There's love in all his words and deeds. There's all a guilty sinner needs forevermore in Jesus. Then the old skeptic wrote, Though some should sneer and some should blame, I'll go with all my guilt and shame. I'll go to him because his name above all names, is Jesus.
Mm. And Jesus is what God is like. He said in John 14, verses 6, 8 and 9, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen uh, the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you want to know what God is like? I can tell you. You want to know what God is like? Look at the cross. Look at the man hanging on the cross. The hands that flung the stars in space were the hands that were nailed to the cross. What is God like? God is like Jesus. Believe and you will see the glory of God. Amen Amen. and amen. Amen. There's only one thing that really counts in this lifetime, your relationship to Christ. And then if you have a right relationship with Christ, you want to tell people about Christ. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. By the grace of God, we're going to do that. We are doing that. That is why we're going back to Cuba, to this communist land, to preach Christ. We're accepting an invitation to go to the the vast, huge city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Been there before, but by the grace of God, we're going back. Please support us. and Please stand with us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. You say, how do you do it? Who who pays the bills? We do. Do you get any help, financial help from the church? No, my friend, we don't. But we get a lot of help from God and from his children. Please support us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. It's the most important work in all the world. Everything else is almost trivia. So would you please Write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Do your best for Jesus. Do your best for the gospel. And uh, in Australia, write to me at Terrigal. And we promise you this, every dime, every dollar is going to be used to win souls to our Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Write to me today. Thank you and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.